Tony, your um, your newest magnum opus has <laughs> arrived, and um, why am I not surprised that after your two previous orchestral suites named Seven and Six, that this one is called Five? Five. Yeah, well, I was actually what didn't want to do it really. I thought it's too obvious, you know, and I don't really like doing the obvious. It's quite fun to slip to four or something, but um, I happen to there are five pieces on this. And it just it seemed, I couldn't fight it. It was a bit like in the early days of Genesis, I couldn't fight it, and then there were three. Just so some things, you know, they're sort of a bit of a joke, and then, of course, they've become the final thing, so yeah. five. But this time I wanted to call it just five. None of this seven or suite or six pieces, you know. Okay. This is just five, and it's just the digit five as well, really. And so we're sort of on a countdown, and I'm, oh, yeah. I'm asking myself what happens when we reach zero. <laughs> well, I think I'll probably have passed away by then. I mean, it's easier if you're Adele and you're working upwards. Even if you are skipping out a few years, you know, you, there's no end, really, is there? <laughs> Yeah. You could do a silent piece, you know, like John I could, Cage. Well, I think zero, I'm quite, I said, also, I'm quite looking forward to zero, you know, but uh, <laughs> I don't think I'll get that far. I might, you know, once you, I, I think 765 is sort of trilogy, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure what I call quaternity, quaternity, I don't know what one is called, but it doesn't sound as good, so I think probably I'll switch to something else if I do another one, yeah. indeed. Uh, well, uh, we've talked before, um, my musical coming of age mm. was as much wrapped up in the, the mega rock bands mm. of the 60s, your own band, Genesis, and Yes, and uh, Pink Floyd, and The Who. Um, I was as much wrapped up in that music, weirdly, as I was in the discovery of classical music. Mm. But you, in a sense, had a similar experience, because you had some classical background Yes, well, as well. I was in when I was a child, I used to get exposed quite a bit to classical music, which I always enjoyed. Um, but I think when I got about 11 or 12, I, I got exposed to pop music, and I just completely fell in love with it. You know, I, I had absolutely no discrimination at all. Everything in 1961 I liked. I can almost still quote the sort of top ten I first listened to, which had Chris Cliff Richards as number one and the young ones, you know, and I included pieces like Let There Be Drums by Sandy Nelson and Multiplication by Bobby, Bobby Dow, which is really kind of diverse and weird stuff. Mm. And I loved it all, really. And, but by the end of the 60s, I kind of got very much the other way, and there was, wasn't much I liked. <laughs> I was got much more picky, I think. I, you know, I found that perhaps that through the 60s, music sort of really evolved, you know, particularly around with people like... Um, Beach Boys, Pet Sounds, I suppose, being mm, probably the most yeah. important album. And then, Great obviously, album. the Beatles, later Beatles, and, and then groups, to, which I really love, like you mentioned, Procol Harum, and I don't know if you did or not, but anyhow, the groups of the late 60s that did well, Procol Harum, Family, Fairport Convention were a big influence. So that kind of took me there. And it wasn't really until I started, I think when I was at university in the late 60s, um, I said, my, a friend I was sharing a room with, he played me um, Shostakovich's 10th Symphony, and I hadn't mm. sort of... And I just forgot how, how exciting, how much I loved classical music. Mm -hmm. I was hearing that first movement, which is just so such a stunning piece of music, one of my favourite pieces anyhow. Yeah. And it just sort of brought me right back. And after that, I was sort of right back in the two together. And, you know, within Genesis, we were able to incorporate some um, elements of classical music. You know, Steve Hackett was also very into classical music. We used to sort of swap ideas and pieces and things we come across a bit between each other. And, and that sort of had some effect on the Genesis music of the time, I think. music was in a sense symphonic it was symphonic rock if you like and mm. um, it was enormously ambitious and sophisticated and you kind of wonder why do you think it just vanished after a while because it's the sort I of I don't think it really vanished I mean with Genesis we kind of got to the stage when I, I felt very strongly uh, by the time we got to 1980 that we were sort of starting to repeat ourselves and it'd be nice to try and do it a bit differently um, I mean the music business had changed we, or we'd managed to survive the sort of <laughs> the punk changeover but with having two of my very successful albums which are still very much in the prog tradition I suppose uh, I think we just I, and the prog has always been part of Genesis always was right to the end I think but we had other the other parts just got more prominent we got better at it got a very high profile suddenly you know it's quite exciting to sort mm. of have hit records and we never really thought we were going to have that I certainly didn't um, and you know obviously with Phil's profile that helped a lot but we you know the first hit we had really was Follow You Follow Me which was you know, pre-Phil's success and everything, and to be honest, wasn't much Phil in that writing on that of many Mike and I, you know, so kind of, 
Um, it was something we sort of went through, I suppose, really. And I suppose, you know, once we're down to three piece, I've kind of lost Peter and Steve, who are perhaps more on my side of the fence in terms of trying to do things, you know, a little bit more off the wall. So, you know, but I mean, I, I having said that, I, I love what we did later Genesis. So I have no problem with that at all. And I was always able to introduce a bit of that quality about it mm. that I loved. But, you know, mm. to be able to come back with the classical stuff to something that is, you know, much more akin to those early yeah. prog days is, is very satisfying. Uh, I mean, you were the keyboard whiz of, of Genesis, and there's definitely a fee- feeling of, of keyboard derivation mm. in the sort of stuff you've written for, for orchestra now, yeah. and the, 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 these, these three suites. There's a spirit of improvisation mm. in that yeah. keyboard derivation, a, a feeling of evolution, and that goes right through into the finished pieces. Mm. Um, is is that well? I do. I mean, a lot of the stuff I do write through improvisations, and sometimes I will just record, just me doodling about for a long time, and I listen back to a bit and think, well, that bit's quite nice, and then I think, well, a bit before it's quite good too, and you end up sort of. I mean, I have at various times just taken sort of like a chunk, you know, it might be 20, 30 seconds, almost of the improvised music, and just obviously tidied up a scrap, mm-hmm. but use that as part of what I did. Did that quite a lot on six, perhaps slightly more than I've done it on this one. Um, I don't know, I kind of, I, I do like to try and get the fresh things. One thing that working with the group really taught me was that if you could get a thing early and you didn't try and fiddle about with it too much, sometimes that early essence was quite good enough on its own. You, you didn't fiddle with it. You know, we used to fiddle with stuff an awful lot back in the early days. Later times, we just sometimes just did it and, and it was great as it was, you know. So I'm a, I'm a believer in trying to pick up on that sort of spontaneous thing. I'm, mm. I'm, I do try very hard when I'm playing to get my conscious brain out of it. And then that way you can sort of play things you don't know you're going to play. And um, the great with computers, which are sort of like an incredibly sophisticated recording machines, not only can you record what you do, you can also see what you did. So if you can't quite remember the particular shapes and stuff, you can see it on on the screen. At the start of the journey, though, there is um, a thematic element so you start with a theme and then you journey with that theme yeah, is that the way the you well, tend to sometimes work? sometimes just sort of mood pieces i mean the opening piece on this uh Prince of Many years obviously starts off with a kind of extended kind of uh, you know slow string passage which is really just a i uh, there's a that very second english actually well, very i know but it's english with, with that blues note in it uh, uh, that second chord to me is is crucial uh, one reason i wanted the whole album to start with that because i thought because you know much as I love Vaughan Williams, he would never use that chord, you see. Yeah. So, and the, you could say the rest of the f- intro has got touches of Vaughan Williams about it, but something like that second chord. You know, and I just, when I first played, I thought, oh, I love that. And he's like, oh, I'm sort of, I only played sort of twice at the beginning, twice in the middle, and once at the end. Right? But I just, something about the effect that has on me that I really love. So I wouldn't call that, it's not thematic, that is just purely a sort of harmonic change that I hadn't heard before, and I just thought really sounded, sounded nice. Mm. Mm. phrase is contemporary English pastoral. Well, it uh, could be. I mean, I don't a, know what contemporary music is. a I twist mean, on it. A lot of contemporary music, is, after all, is something completely different, yeah. but it's very eternal. I mean, I antithesis of, of contemporary music in a way, well, not all contemporary music, but so much contemporary music, because it is based around melody, as you say, melody and harmony. And I love, I like melody and harmony that is kind of, sort of slightly more unusual, I suppose. Um, and so my, almost my favourite classical composers, you know, tend to be sort of like you know, late 19th century through till about 1950s, 60s, I suppose I mentioned Shostakovich, obviously, but mm. those sort of people who use kind of like conventional harmony, but did some kind of weird things with it. And exactly. I love that. You know, yes. I, I really yes. enjoy that. Yes, so still writing tonally, but with, with Yes, twists. that's right. I, once it gets sort of, you know, just atonal and tuneless, I, 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 I just, I can't follow it at all. It's not for me. I, I, well, because you're a melodist as well. well I'm a melodist, I but, I, you are but a I like things in other people. You know, I'm not a kind of heavy metal man, really, but I love listening to heavy metal. You know, so you can't, you don't just like what you can do. You know, yeah. I, I can't do so. I'm not very good at writing a three-minute pop song, although I've been involved in quite a few, I suppose. But I don't feel that's my forte. I, give me, give me a twelve minutes, and I'm, I'm, I'm I can yeah, do something. Yeah, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say, on balance, that you prefer to journey than to arrive? Because that's that's a feeling I get from these pieces. That yeah. it's the journey that's that's interesting. I love. Um, although they all aspire 
to arrive somewhere cathartic, if you like, somewhere... I love the creation of the music. I suppose that's what gives me the greatest pleasure. But no, I really enjoy arriving and sorting it out. I mean, you know, sometimes over the years, you know, you, you, you get to the end of something, you're not quite sure whether you've really finished it, and sometimes there's some bat later on, you think, oh, you know, I could have done that. And obviously at this stage of this object, and you just finished it, so I'm kind of pretty, you know, pretty happy with the way they've all turned out. I, I was pretty happy with the conclusion on all of these, really. Yeah. And, um, you know, but yes, you, I can't argue that sort of getting there, because all the hundreds of bits you don't end up using... <laughs> And all the little deviations you take and some of the sort of changes you have, that, that's really nice, but I can't use that as too much, you know, and all the rest of it, just to try and keep it, you know, so it doesn't become totally amorphous. I mean, people might say 15-minute piece is amorphous anyhow, but it kind of has a sort of structure. There are certain repeated passages in it. There's yes, logic, certainly in the first piece. Yeah, there's um, a logic about it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not verse, chorus, middle eight, obviously, but it does have repeated passages. In fact, the first, you know, the first half... And, the second half is it sort of almost a repeat of the first half, but with quite yeah. a few extensions and, yeah. and obviously arrangement very different. It's a 15-minute piece, the opening mm. piece, and it was originally written for the Cheltenham Festival um, right. as an orchestral piece to be performed live. Yeah. Um, no pressure at all. Well, I know. I don't. Um, <laughs> um, uh, now, interesting. You work with this orchestrator, Nick Ingman, mm. and um, talk us through the process of of, of creating that opening piece for, for Cheltenham? Because it was originally called Arpeggio? Well, I called it Arpeggio. It was just a working title, Arpeggio, it was called. just, And it went on the on the programme as Arpeggio, because I hadn't really sort of... Thought, and right. I, I quite liked Arpeggio as a title, but everyone said, oh, no, you can't call it that, you know. Because I wanted that idea of the... So I like Arpeggios because this sort of sort of churning forward movement. I'd done a couple of pieces on six where I'd wanted the Arpeggios to be a bit stronger, mm. you know, and carry on slightly more. And uh, Paul Inchby, I worked with, is a fantastic writer himself. But, you know, he's kind of, what I was doing was slightly more rock idiom. He kind of didn't, you know, pulled me back from that sometimes yeah. slightly. And I, in the end, I slightly regretted that. So I wanted on this one, actually, by calling it arpeggio, and I did the original arrangement we did with Paul, um, to say, I want to keep the arpeggios in, you know. <laughs> taught me that I wanted to approach this differently so I thought this time I'm going to go into the studio and I'm going to do it slightly more artificially I'm going to go in there use my demos I'm going to make them get my demos absolutely as far on as I can get the arrangements as far on as I can get all the tempos absolutely sorted all the rallentandos every little tempo thing wow. and use that as a template and play everything to it mm. that way at least I knew all the tempos were going to be correct and it because Nick is kind of comes from you know he sort of that straddles the world of pop, um, classical and film, and he's, he's very used to working, uh, recording things separately. So that's what we did. We went in the studio, using my demos as a sort of background thing. We then did the, um, we did the solo instruments with the trumpet, uh, saxophone, and then also did the, all the percussion and the harp. We did those all in London. So we did them all separately, so we could scrutinise all the parts. So like a pop record, yeah, really. in a way. Yeah. And they all worked, obviously, because they had to work with the arrangements we got down, which was a combination of what I'd done and a few things that Nick had done as well. And then we went to the um, to Prague to record the orchestra, and we did it again in sections. We did the strings uh, for a couple of days, and we did the woodwind and the flute and the choir. Um, so it, you know, it sounds artificial, but I think when you ask people to play music they've never heard before, mm. it's very difficult for an orchestra to really get their heads around it. And that's what the problem I had before. If it's soft and it's easier, as soon as you get any kind of rhythm in it, I took a long time with the first one of these things. I did seven of getting then the rhythmical idea I had on the final piece on that across to the orchestra. And by the time we got that, we had no time for anything else, and the, the resultant piece was not satisfactory, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So this time I wanted to get as much sorted out as possible. And, you know, I knew, so the, the arrangements I'd done kind of really suggested so much of what the final thing was going to sound like anyhow. Add what Nick added, which was particularly in the percussion area, but lots of other little bits and pieces. I mean, he's, you know, he does things in orchestra I wouldn't think about. Um, and the result, you know, I'm so much happier with it because the tempo is an extraordinarily important thing. I think when you, you hear a piece and it's, even if some bits are right, there's one little change that's not right. You know, in the beginning, for example, take the project of Mignonese, because that first part is completely timeless. Uh, Nick created a kind of sort of click he could play with and can get to the orchestra to play with. 
it had a little moment in the middle, which definitely is kind of slightly strange. And when we did it down in um, uh, Cheltenham, because Paul had written it out in stricter time, yeah, it was not quite working. There was one little change that was just so wrong. Mm. And, you know, obviously we could have we could worked on that and got it more right, but it needed that approach just to play everything exactly as I played it. Because I, I really felt those changes happening exactly the moment they did, I, even though they're not in time, you know. And I wanted to get that across. So, And with the rest of it, the only thing we kept from my original demos was the piano all the way through okay. and some of the Celeste parts. Um, and that was used that as a starting point. Mm. Well, there's obviously a... a, a a great element of control here about mm. wanting to have all the parts there that, so you can play with them in the mix. Well, that's right. Um, because otherwise you're reliant upon session time and rehearsal time. And, and also the thing is you get a great woodwind part and the strings aren't so good. And, of course, there's so much spill with the microphones. Exactly. You, you can't do it. And you can exactly. edit, obviously. But, you know, with this, I can have total separation. You know. Um, melodic profile of your music a little bit more because it, it's definitely there and tunesmiths are a real dying breed I think these days um, and um, the melodies in your pieces feel like they're evolving um, melodically and harmonically mm. obviously you're working with, with lots of chords in the playing of them I mm. always think they feel like they're evolving yeah. in the playing of them I know you've mentioned this before you're a big fan of one of my idols Richard Rogers um, oh, yeah. mm who, to, to my mind, is the greatest popular melodist of them all. His versatility was such yeah, that no, he was uh, right, he was really very special. Um, you mentioned, um, I mean, is that something you're... I mean, it's, it seems so instinctive and spontaneous, um, the way melodies and harmonies evolve from your music mm. is that something you're conscious of or it's just something you just doodle away I think it's often, how, do you, how do you start what's the start I think often the, well, it's, it depends sometimes it is just, just a chord pattern or, or a note pattern or something that kind of starts it off and the melodic line sometimes comes afterwards not always I mean no, that's it was certainly true when I did the solo ones on the last last thing with the, the, the violin part the violin and the sax on this one most of the <laughs> A lot of it was there in, in, the, in the thing, and you sometimes you, you just enhance a little bit what's going on anyhow with the piano mm. part. Other times it's very intrinsic. I mean, the part, there's one piece called Autumn Sonata where the actual melodic line is, was the reason for it. I mean, it's just two chords, you know, really, uh, the first part of it. I'm afraid I embellished it. I couldn't stop myself going a bit subtler after a while, but it was just really two chords, so it's the actual line that is really crucial, and that's why it exists. Mm. So you have lots of melodies which are like that, others which evolve out the chords, some which are actually, you know, like... Um, with the, the, the sax parts on, on the piece um, Ebb and Flow, the faster sax parts, I mean, all that was kind of, I just had this backing, which I really liked, you know, the piano doing a certain part, which ended up being the strings playing it. Um, and I just doodled around lots of melodies on top of it, and I sort of created a kind of result from that. I like doing that. It's a bit like I used to work with Genesis when we were doing things like Cinema Show or Apocalypse and 9-8, where you kind of, you know, you had a, ba a basis, and then you'd write a kind of a melodic line on top. Mm. You knew you had something good as a starting point, and then you could do something on top of it, which was hopefully good in itself, but also enhanced what was there. You know? Well, all music is is development of yeah, ideas, isn't right. it? Really, I mean, it's it's. I mean, that word is used in in musical theory all the time. Mm. Uh, the development section, and mm. that's exactly what it what it is and what it does. <laughs> I like using um, solo instruments in an obligato mm. way. Um, you did in your other pieces, and here you've got, for example, in Revali, mm. you've got um, John Barclay's cornet, mm. and um, 
I, I really like this piece for its exultancy. I mean, it is a kind of musical wake-up call. Mm, well, Ravalli is supposed to be sort of, you know, I called it that because of the, you know, the, 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 the army sort of wake-up. Because the prelude is a prelude, you know, it sort of sets, sets the team overture, if you like, and then suddenly you get the Ravalli. This is where we really start, in a way. And, uh, yeah, it's a very up piece, you know, and I'm, I'm known for sort of writing quite a few fairly miserable pieces, but I think most of the tracks on, on this album, actually, well, I can't call them tracks these days, I have to call them... Movements, I suppose, don't I? Um, are fairly, fairly positive. Quite a lot of major keys and, and ending kind of on an upbeat note and stuff, you know. So Ravalli, yes, I mean it's you know, and I like I, the idea of using a trumpet as, as the line was. I was just fiddling around on my, on the, what I had, and I happened to have a, a quite a nice trumpet sample around, and I just tried it. I thought that really set the tone for this piece, you know, in a way, in a way you because you you have to really try when you're playing with a sample to think like the player, you know, not just play piano, you know, all the time, and a few times I do that and you cheat a bit, but if you can really think what the player might do and what it might sound like when it's a trumpet or when it's a flute or whatever it is, then I think you, you, it works really well, and, and um, yeah, it was great, and I mean, John really rose to the occasion, because although I say I write like a trumpet player, I do go quite a lot, or a cornet player, whatever, I often go quite a lot higher <laughs> than they would choose to go, <laughs> so you get these marvelous moments of the poor guy sort of go, you got like this little trumpet and think about this big, oh, you know, yeah. to, play trumpet, the, yeah, yeah. to play at the end. Yeah. But it was wonderful because, uh, you know, and okay, you can cheat a bit because it's done on its own. If you want to suddenly slip in, you can do that. result doesn't sound artificial but you, the, how you get there I mean most film music is put together in this kind of way you know and I'm, I'm sure I don't know whether it's ever been I, mean, I do it because these pieces have never been performed live well apart from the prelude it's it's sort of it's a way of doing it and I know the classical conventional method is the thing goes play to an audience first and and then you kind of fiddle around with it a bit maybe and then you then you record it but I come from such a different background you know I come from that area where you create the piece on record and that's the, is definitive in a way. Yeah. You also think in a composerly way, though, because in Ravalli, there is a contrasting mm. idea and a contrasting because you know you 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 probably wouldn't want to sustain that kind of wake no, up I call. I did repeat it one more time, and I was going to yeah. going around the circles. Yeah. I thought I was going away from it too quickly, but that was yeah. the, the loud bit. You know. Mind you, you mentioned Shostakovich Ten. I mean, the scherzo yeah. movement, the second movement yeah, of Shostakovich yeah. Ten, sustains that. Freneticism. I know. Well, they do. A bit I mean, angry. I think it's quite difficult with with the scherzos to really keep them going, you know. But this because it was sort of like <laughs> it's quite a slightly militaristic feel. It's quite sort of whereas you know uh, the preludes are quite rambling. You've got this because it's quite specific, you know, and fairly simple harmonically, and, you, and it's quite driving, you know. I, I sort of got a bit relentless, and I was sort of adding things every time round. You know, so I'm sort of bass, and then Nick's idea was to add the choir, and oh, we weren't there, so I had to go somewhere. Yeah. So it had a second theme, which is sort of a related theme in a way. It's kind of melodic, melodically kind of connected, I thought. And by having quite a sort of definite key change between the two bits, you know, to sort of make it kind of much more soothing and relaxing. <laughs> these pieces as a suite from the start or were they separate pieces that you decided selectively to put them into a suite in the end? I think those happened to be the five pieces I've written at this point in time. Right. Uh, there was some, when I wrote the piece for um, Cheltenham, I had the second piece which a lot of it, which is ended up in ebb and flow. Those kind of were almost competing as to be which was the main one and there was a little bit of related theme work between the two. They kind of sort of got separated out completely so those two are always together I think. The, I just, I, once I'd written the, f the four pieces, you know, the, the main thing was that in order to make the, p the suite work, I knew I knew, it wasn't because you had to call it five, mind you, 
I knew I had to have the other piece, the fifth piece. And when Nick suggested using the choir, which I thought was a nice idea, but using it very much as a sort of block chord thing in, in the two of the pieces, I thought, wouldn't it be great to do one piece where the choir is much more prominent, much more dominant? And I'd come across this little bit I had never found a home for, which I'd written about 20 years ago as a possible sort of on a film demo tape or something. I'd done something, you know, which was just a, a drone. It was a sort of a, with a few weird notes and then a little melody coming after it. And I just, when I came across it, I thought, it sounds, so, it sounds really good. I really must try and develop this. And I thought, it's a perfect time. Got that big vocal crescendos in there. Mm. Uh, and let's do this. And so I the, wrote the rest of the piece from that starting point, you know, drawing together a few ideas, but also... This is uh, Renaissance. Renaissance, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's the most... So in a way, although it has the bit and starts, it's 20 years old, it's the most recent piece in a way. And in some ways, it's closest, I'm closest to that for that reason, I suppose. Mm. And it's quite different from the others because it's much more... It's more moody. I'd say it's also more... And it ends with this very sort of triumphant, very solid, almost song-like piece. I'd say it's the closest of all the five pieces to, to progressive music, you know what I mean? <laughs> the way it's approached it and some of the sounds and, and the thing, and particularly that final part. I just thought it had to be the final piece because that final part is, is just so sort of like going to the sunset for mm. me, you know? <laughs> mm. Mm. I, I just love the melody and I just... It was just That's what I meant by catharsis. Yeah, see, well, it's a that, really cathartic piece, I think, that. Resolution. I mean, the, the only problem I'd say with, with, for me in this is the fact that, you know, it, it's an album, it's a piece... Well, each piece, but also the thing as a totality, is best listened to all, all together. Yeah. Now, you're asking a lot of people nowadays, and I'm told their attention plan is now perhaps 25 seconds, you know. Um, <laughs> 25 seconds of this, you haven't even got to the sort of the first chord change, you know, <laughs> on this thing. And it's true of most of the pieces. So I'm, I'm a bit out of my time here, I think. But, you know, I think if people, particularly people who used to like the old prog stuff, but also hopefully a lot of people who like, you know, classical music in general, um, because this does owe a certain amount to sort of to the, the Vaughan Williamses and Elgars and Sibeliuses and stuff, I think, a bit. I mean, I can't help that. I am influenced by those people. Mm. Um, and I don't think it's... Um, I don't think... It, I think it would be, a, you know, enjoyable listen for those people as well. Uh, it's... I can't really fight what I do. I don't have a certain way of work. I like extended pieces. I've never been... I mean, well, it's what I do best, put it like that. I don't... I like short pieces, but I'm not... I'm not sort of this before um, very filmic um, and you've written a couple of film scores you wrote uh, The Wicked Lady for Michael Winner and um, Skolomowski's thriller The Shout mm -hmm. which you did with Mike Rutherford That's right. um, I cannot understand why there's not a queue of people waiting for you to write movie scores well, I should because, try. Because, I should do this for real. As a, as a keyboard, uh, you know, you think of Hans Zimmer and, yeah. and people who work ex from keyboard programs. Yeah. I'd have thought. Well, I did try this quite hard. I, I think I'm not. I'm not a very pushy person myself. I'm not very good at sort of doing what's required. I don't think. In the, the late '90s, when Genesis was kind of like looking like it was going to go, sort of not do much, um, both before and after the Calling All Stations album, I did. I actually got myself an agent and, and auditioned a few times to, to do this with people. Really? You know, I went there and things, and nothing came of it at all. It's a pretty really close shop. Isn't it's it, a close really? shop. Yeah. Also, I just thought that people, I don't know really, they, I did have, you know, I had one or two experiences with the films that weren't quite so good. I mean, I was originally down to do the music to the film 2010, um, and the director, Peter Hyams, who'd, who liked what I'd done for The Shout so much, he could sing the, the theme, you know. <laughs> I thought, can sing that, it's not really singable, and he can sing it to me, that's fantastic. So I thought, this is easy, that's the sort of stuff I write in my sleep. And so I gave him some demos, I gave him a demo of a particular piece, I thought it would be great for it, and, and he said no, and we kind of, after being on it for a very fraught period of two or three months, um, I suppose I was sacked, to be honest, no, no other way of putting it. Um, the, the producer on, on the, uh, of the film was, was very keen on what I'd done, he used to play the stuff, he said, and his car also loved it. But the, the director, he was one of those directors, Pete Himes, who wanted to do it all himself. And he ended up actually using uh, James Horner. And it was one of his earlier pieces and sort of, you know, where he went in the yeah. end. And he's a very good, um, 
uh, sort of film writer, you know, and if that's a, and he just wanted to, I didn't realize he just wanted a conventional film score. I thought he wanted something a little stranger, and that was the problem I had with it. Really. But anyhow, so I haven't had great experiences. I've done a couple of other films as well, not both of which have sort of, <laughs> I don't know whether it's, hopefully it wasn't because of the music, but neither really did very well. Um, so, yes, I, 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 at one point I would have loved to have done a lot of films. I don't know about now. I've had the freedom to do these things, and, you know, the idea of sort of having to yeah. bow to a director's wishes would be too tough, unless they wanted to use one of these pieces and I could adapt it a little. favourite among these pieces? Well, I think Renaissance at the moment, but that's yeah. today. And so, that, of course, uses also unusually a, um, uh, an instrument called the duduk, yeah. which is an Armenian instrument, mm -hmm. closely related, I suppose, to the cor anglais. It's a, it's a sorrowful kind of... So I think if you, if you close your eyes and not thinking too much about it, it can sound a bit like a gazoo, but it's... Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's no, it was... Well, the original idea of using that was Martin Robertson, who I've known since he was knee-high to me. To a grasshopper, I suppose. I don't know. Um, he, you know, you know I love he's, he's a sax player. He's a very good sax player and other stuff. So yeah. he, I've used him obviously over in my career a few times. He, he said, you should use the duduk. I want you to use the duduk. So I said, okay, okay, use the duduk. So when he came into the session, he brought his duduk, and I had this little melody that I'd originally just seen being sung with the, with the choir going ooh, you know. And I thought, and so we thought the idea of him playing that. And in the end, we used a combination of him playing the duduk plus the choir, and it's actually because it's a really nice ethereal quality, really. Mm. Slightly unusual melody, and um, it's really nice. So it, it's a funny instrument because it, it looks quite quite basic, you know. Mm. It doesn't, it's not like you say an oboe, but I mean, that's got all sorts of knobs and, and uh, <laughs> um, stuff on the metal on it and stuff. This doesn't have any of that, really, but it, it's a lovely sound, yeah. Yeah, it, it, that, that, that piece does have a kind of atmospheric, mysterious mm. feel to it, but you're heading again, as I keep saying, to mm. something affirmative, to something positive. Yeah, and well, it starts off with this sort trend. of quite moody, and it's almost slightly got in slightly Middle Eastern sort of notes and stuff, I suppose, at the beginning, you know. So that's where, probably where the Duduk sort of feel comes in, works quite well, and then it gets slowly more and more sort of structured, I suppose. It, it, it's... But just, I, I had a, you know, I don't have enough silence in my pieces, I, I'm aware of that. But this actually does have a half second of complete silence in it, which I, I'm very proud of. <laughs> um, and, it's, and when it comes in as this big piano chord with, with the whole orchestra, it, it's just such a strong moment, I feel yeah. like, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's sort of worth it just for that one bit. <laughs> the rest of it, I forget it, but that Do you listen great. to a lot of, um, of, of music, as well as playing with music? Do you listen I don't to listen to nearly enough, actually. Yeah. In fact, when I started doing this, I realised I was saying how much I liked certain pieces, and I was realising how, when I last heard them, it was a very long time ago, so I actually had a session um, a couple, two or three weeks ago, I listened to a lot of those pieces I used to love, you know, I still love them, and I hear them again, and they, it's amazing how they come back to me, I find myself sort of, sort of you know, my brain won't stop sort of repeating them in my, in my mind. Um, now, I tend to, I, I get so saturated with my own music, I think, um, and not having just been doing the, this stuff, I've also you know, had the, the re-release of all my old stuff and things, and also all the Genesis stuff over the years. Head gets very full, and I tend to, when I'm listening in the car and stuff, I tend to listen to Radio 4 most of the time. Right. You know? ideal day I mean do you, do, you, do you make music every day no well, I have periods when I do I haven't played 
I have played surprisingly little actually since uh, since doing all this. I think I need to flush it out of my system a bit really. I I love just sitting down and playing, and I love sort of writing things. But as soon as you start to write them, you sort of the whole ball is rolling again, you know. And I, I mean, I just don't know whether I want to do that again or not. I don't know. I can't make up my mind about it really. Mm. In a sense, you know, I've got a certain age, and and it, I love I love writing music. I love recording it enough. So I don't know. The putting it out is always. It's it's the sort of it, that's the difficult bit because yeah. then you've got other people's opinions. You know, I don't really want to know what they think. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I mean, you have to accept that if you want to be. I've been very lucky over the years that so much music I've been involved with, obviously with Genesis, has had such you know had a great response from the audience, and that's fantastic, really. So, you know, I can never expect that again. So it's um, it's nice, you know. And I, well, I was when I did seven, the first of these three pieces, it actually got quite a good response better than I'd had from any of my solo albums sorry, before that. So that kind of encouraged me a little bit, you know. And, uh, I remember us talking about Blade, mm. um, which has the solo violin part mm. in it, and um, you were talking about the fun of being able to bend notes mm. and, mm. and mm. use glissandi and mm. stuff mm. like that. And it occurred to me, and I've been thinking about this ever since, why don't you write an electric guitar concerto? Because nobody else has done so, or one, I know of one, yeah. and it was written by a contemporary composer who didn't really understand the instrument. Well, I mean, obviously that's it's 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 a it's a, it's a good thought because I think guitars is a very expressive instrument. I mean, it is the modern violin in many ways, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it has that sort of ability to to pull the heartstrings and just play two notes. So you can just sort of yeah. do it as opposed to two notes on a piano. Doesn't sound like anything. Two notes on a guitar can really really move you. Yeah, well, it's an, obviously an idea, you know. I mean, I. I I don't know really. I probably because by the when I'm playing along and sort of I get I think well a flute you know and I play the flute and of course then suddenly the flute's taken over, <laughs> and my guitar samples aren't, aren't quite so good. I mean my guitar playing is even worse than my guitar samples. So um, I can I can strum along. I'm okay as a, as a rhythm guitarist, but I'm, yeah. in my league I did have had the odd moment of trying the guitarist. So I do understand it a bit the guitar, and I play with enough people to know what sounds good. But I think. It, some extent, I suppose you probably would need the input from a guitarist at a reasonably mm. early stage. I mm. think. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, do you have any idea of? Uh, do you want to continue writing I in this way? Do you want to continue writing with an orchestrator and for orchestra, or might you move away from it completely? I've absolutely really no idea. I haven't thought about. It. I said there are, there are three or four options. One is yes, another one like this, another one is uh, the drums. I love drums, so there's always that as a possibility. It's just as in the solo album world, it's, it seems a bit pointless because I said that it didn't really work for me in the past. Um, I think Genesis anything is pretty unlikely. And obviously the fourth option is to do nothing at all. And I think all those options are, are possibilities, really. I have a great admiration for Sibelius, who didn't write anything for the last 40 years of his life, you know. Um, and he wrote the most fantastic, that Seventh Symphony is a wonderful piece of music, you know, it's a pretty good piece to end on. Um, so I don't know, really. I mean, sometimes you think, well, I've done it, really. I mean, you can say to yourself, am I going to do better than that? I mean, Sibelius did pretty well with what he did. Um, and maybe at a certain point you just think, I don't know that I can really... I can really do anything other than that, you know, I've, I've done it, you know. So I, I do get that feeling sometimes, and I... I don't really know. I mean, obviously, degrees of success can make a big difference. I suppose if suddenly this, you know, people it went a bit further than some of the others, it might encourage me. But, um, but on the other hand, you know, as I said, I sit down at the piano, I get seduced by it. I go, oh, that's nice, that change, you know. And then you want to do that, and you want to do that. And once you've finished a piece, you think, well, what am I going to do with it? I can't just sit on it and sort of, you know, <laughs> I've got to put it out somewhere. So I don't know. Yeah, I would see myself doing something, but God knows what. <laughs> 